I was uh, drawn into music by partly having a musical background, going to visit my father, uh, he was a musician, um, but also just to, out of an interest to learn instruments, started on the piano, violin, uh, and then later on got the bug to learn um, a brass instrument and went down the line. When I was about 17, it seemed logical to um, bring my perspectives, different perspectives from within the orchestra and also outside the orchestra and as a pianist, to look at the whole picture. And of course, the conductor has that picture in front of them, and as well as understanding the structure and working with some great musicians who taught me really the art of rehearsal technique, um, I was really able to. Uh, make that my primary goal to be a conductor. But one of the first conductors I saw was actually Sean Edwards, who was a female conductor. So that was um, just the norm for me compared to you know the other conductors I saw. I saw a woman on the podium then, and I didn't think twice about it. Okay. The figures, which are all several right, years so old, right. show about 12% of uh, music directors in in the top 85 orchestras that are female. Um, you go to the top 24 orchestras, i.e. the biggest budget orchestras, then you're talking about one. So uh, then if you look at the number of students who are studying conducting or youth orchestras who are conducted by women, it's, it's more even. So it is uh, a work in progress. Um, certainly I'm glad that things are open enough for me to um, now be in my third music directorship as a woman conductor um, and hopefully things will continue to change at a faster rate than they have in the past. Well the opening night for me you know I'm, I'm really focused as a, as a musician as well as the musicians there getting ready to perform and um, I like as, as few sort of distractions because you know I, I'm, I'm thinking about the music and, and, and that doesn't stop so if I'm having a conversation I'm still thinking about the music and, and uh, you know that that subconscious development never stops you're still looking at the piece understanding it pacing it thinking about the rhythm that there's so many different aspects to a piece of music that uh, one tries to understand when you when you perform it. I had that thought, you know, we're starting this fantastically strong da -da, da -da. I think we can take it down a notch, even the beginning. The role of a music director in American orchestra is very multifaceted. So number one, you have to be an um, excellent musician, you have to provide great artistic leadership on the podium for the musicians to um, look up to, to respect, to enhance their own ability. Uh, I think of the job of a conductor really is to help the musicians on stage play the best they possibly can do. Um, and so that's a, a critical piece of presenting an exciting concert. You know, everybody on stage needs to be um, excited, enthused, prepared, ready to give an amazing performance. So that's the first job. And, and the second is to really see how uh, the symphony can be part of the community, how it can enhance the, um, the culture of the city, how it can support the schools that need music programs, how it can interact, how it can provide music, uh, classical music that's free to uh, people all over the city and as far reaching as possible. This is part of it is something that I am passionate about is um, bringing my own um, artistic creativity to the programming. And um, every person has a unique um, approach to it. Um, but for me, you know, this is, this is a team uh, I want to incorporate the ideas of uh, a lot of people who know Tacoma 
and have been here much longer than I have, so I'll also look at what has been done and build on that, those successes and maybe change them a little bit so that, that it's still uh, refreshing, but that that excitement that was there for it still will exist and perhaps even on a much bigger scale. As I go around and conduct and go to other concerts and travel, I'm constantly um, turning the wheel for artistic ideas, programming. Um, I have way more artistic plans in my head than I can realize um, and projects that, that I, I would like to see happen. Um, and so really when it comes to the, the point of our laying down the season, we are juggling a variety of um, aspects, you know, of course a budget and um, what will work here, what will be suitable for Tacoma, what will excite them. And so as I also go around and get to know Tacoma, it's giving me ideas about what I think would be a suitable program for for this city and, and the people here. Well, Tacoma, you know, it's, it's a unique place. It has a, such a, an amazing setting. Um, I love the Pacific Northwest. I mean, it has a different feel to it than the East Coast. It has a different feel to it than California. Um, it's very down to earth, it's very approachable, it's very creative, very artistic, um, you know, obviously a high concentration of, of very bright and, and sharp and um, creative minds doing brilliant things. That's a pretty good draw. Celestial events in small hemispheres with specific latitudes and defined longitudes mark the universe and echo into the record. My name is Lucas Moraldo, and I am a poet that really enjoys collaborations. Along with poetry, I do spoken word, I collaborate with musicians. So I love poetry spoken, and I also love to fuse that with other performing art forms. Like a vacuum in space-time, gone, banished from this town in a human race catastrophe and their forebears spread like molten fragments into other towns. Well, we are at the Chinese Reconciliation Park, uh, which you see behind me, which is a, a Ting, beautiful structure which represents Chinese architecture, as well as plaques and other materials that tell the story both visually and in word and recognize and hopefully begin to write the history that uh, was such a, a painful one for many Chinese Americans. The crime had been committed, but the file was buried in the archives and one word was placed next to the title Chinese in the city's filing system, and that word was missing. Walking into what I believe is a sacred and spiritual space that's been sacred and made sacred and spiritual by a decision on the part of the leadership here and Chinese Americans that are connected with this community to give people a chance to, to visit and to think about and contemplate what happened here. Well, a typical experience for me coming to visit the park is more about being available, opening myself up and just being present when I'm at the park. And the thing that, that this park does, I think, is to reference absence. Because the reason that Tacoma does not have the same kind of a thriving uh, Chinese American business district and Chinese American community is because of a single collective horrendous act. Will the moon please step forward? Please state your name. Please declare your intention. Please tell us this story so that we hold it in our hearts as if we could light rust and could direct the sun to penetrate a 100 year darkness. Please tell us what you saw and how you felt as once again, one people sought to eliminate the sight of another and please tell us what to do. The rebuilding of community and of the Chinese American community, which is so present in Seattle and Portland and Vancouver, is a very long-term proposition. But this park 
I think is an initial step towards rebuild, rebuilding and healing and um, it gives people a chance to take a journey, I, I suppose. My choice about coming here today was to reinforce all of the work that a lot of people have been putting into revisiting uh, the expulsion and in, enforcing the idea of reconciliation um, and making that, bringing that to the awareness of a broader audience so that um, that particular healing thing will come forward. We must earn our way back into balance and welcome our brothers and sisters home. The moon may step down now. The rest is up to us. small one just right. Uh -huh. <laughs> <I know. laughs> People will meet at coffee shops, mm -hmm. they'll meet at restaurants, they'll meet at pubs. We like to go to pubs and knit. That's <laughs> we'll have like knitting dates and drink beer and I like that. um knit. But I knit everywhere. I knit that was, yeah, that was the best question. Or really don't you knit? Yes. Yeah, we're that, would be more, I don't that would be an easier right? that would be question. an easier question. I, I don't knit in the shower. That's <laughs> <laughs> the bathroom's off, yeah. <laughs> That's where I don't knit, but um, it's just a really nice way to pass time. I don't, I don't get frustrated when I have to wait because I look at it as an opportunity to exactly. be productive. It's like, oh good, I can get my hair out. Yeah, it's like free time. <laughs> yes. So Russ, um, since you're a gentleman, I see in your knitting, my oldest son also is a knitter and a crocheter. Oh, cool. He often gets some different looks when he's out. Does he knit at school or in public or everywhere? Everywhere. We did have one guy come up to me once and what did he say? He said, what are you, some kind of sissy? <laughs> and we were kind oh, no. of blown away because yeah. uh, he just came out right out with it and I think we were polite. We thought of witty things to say afterwards that we didn't say in the moment. <laughs> Basically it's just a series of knots. Mm -hmm. You know that we're making, mm -hmm. okay. and but it can be they tie knots and you know teach knot tying and boy scouts, and it kind of comes right from that. It isn't just women's work. It's no. not. For me, no, as a guy, it's just as complex as you want to make it. It can be really challenging, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and if it's something that is cool and works your brain over a little bit, that's awesome. One of my Facebook friends Facebooked me the other day and said, "I wore my hat to the top of Mount Rainier." See, that feels good, and right? It feels good, because like, I couldn't go to the top of the mountain right here, but my hat went there. So. <laughs> Last year, I just decided to take it to the street and uh, do a little yarn awareness. So during my walks, it just came to me one night, and I looked at my friend and I said, you know, I'm going to put yarn on that. And that. And that. And that. And that. And that. And, and that. that. <laughs> <laughs> and that spawned the whole thing. <laughs> so. I put it on, I didn't know what the reaction was going to be when I very first started doing it. So I was kind of like out there in the dark, I didn't know if like people would yell at me or <laughs> tell me not to do it or... I just had no idea what the reaction was going to be and it's been so positive, it's just been such a wonderful thing. The bikers love it because a lot of the people on 6th Avenue ride their vintage bikes and so when they tie up to the thing, it doesn't scratch their beautiful paint jobs on the bike. So they've really embraced them. Oh, they sure. love them. Yeah. The little kids love them because they're just the right height, the right eye level for them. You know how kids like to hang on bars and they're soft and so I see the kids like hugging them. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's so adorable. That's great. That's I have great. a lot of bicycles but I have one bike that I rode in the Fremont Parade and so I had a, some of my better knitter friends and myself, we yarn bombed my entire bicycle yeah, and people smile that's and great. it's just a lot of fun. Except I took it camping this year and I was riding it around the campground and now there's a bunch of pine cones stuck to it. <laughs> Better than Velcro. Yeah, I'm gonna have to pick off pine cones from the bike.
Well, I think for me, so much of it is about the about the materials, the yarns. That's why I say every project is a favorite because a yarn, I'll pick up a particular yarn that appeals and work with it. So, you know, that's exciting to do that particular project. And then down the road, there'll be another yarn that will <laughs> come along that appeals. And, have this, I'll have the same response to it. I find it kind of meditative. It's the one time where I can kind of quiet my mind. It's like a quiet place yeah. for me where... Yeah, I think it is for, for me too. Yeah. That, um, that's perhaps one of the reasons that it's so enjoyable to do. It is almost like meditative. Yeah. You can just kind of shut out the bad days and not have the stress of the day there and it's a way to relax because I can't actually sit and meditate. I get <laughs> well, and you, down the line, you actually, it's productive. <laughs> yes. So you don't sort of begrudge that time that you're, you're giving to this meditative activity. It's productive. Okay, one row. There we go. That was it. One row. You finished okay. one row? Uh, and as far as I know, my stitch count was correct, maybe. Well, great. I don't even know. <laughs> so now you have to do another one. I have to go back the other way and then we'll see how that goes. <laughs> And then I'll count at the end. <laughs> right. That's how long it takes to do one row in my world. <laughs> long time. My name is Kim Davenport, and I've been playing the piano, oh gosh, since I was about five or six. Grew up in a musical family. I am a pianist and teach piano, and also teach music classes at UW-Tacoma. Also with my family, I run a music publishing company and recording label. My specialty is collaborating with living composers and getting their works exposure both through performing but also through publishing their music and, and rec new recordings. A day in my life is, is fairly solitary. A lot of hours spent at the piano and also in my home office working on the business side of things. Thea's Park is one of the many beautiful parks in Tacoma that inspires me. And I think it's fairly unique to Tacoma to have so many wonderful fairly solitary, beautiful natural spaces, which are also so embedded in an urban environment. I think that's what I love particularly about this park. There's the, the industry on one side and the city skyline on the other and beautiful views of Mount Rainier. And I love to just come here and watch the, the water and, and all the activity happening just to get away again from those hours spent in front of the the piano or the computer and get myself re-energized and re-inspired. Hammett was a um, writer, an important American writer, really, in the kind of golden age of, um, of American literature. I mean, uh, Dashiell Hammett, his real name was Samuel Dashiell Hammett. Hammett goes ahead and writes, um, you know, a couple of novels, writes 100 short stories and five novels, actually. He finally gets around in 1924 to writing The Maltese Falcon, and I think that generally is viewed not only as his masterpiece, but one of the really great works of American fiction during that time. Talk about a page turner, that book yeah. just flies through. There's only two places in The Maltese Falcon where the, where the story pauses to, to kind of let the reader catch their breath. And this was an obvious cut when John Huston made The Maltese Falcon into a movie um, in 1941. Sam Spade is sitting in a hotel room talking to Bridget O'Shaughnessy, yeah. uh, waiting for another character, and, and they're just passing time. 
And for no really explainable reason, he tells her the story, um, which today is now referred to as the Flipcraft Parable, yeah. which is this very, very modern, existential, very much in a realist style. It's almost in a different literary style. Mm -hmm. But he tells her this story um, that Sam uh, that that Sam remembered from an earlier case yeah. where where Spade had been hired by a woman to trace down a former husband. Yeah, and a current husband. Yeah, <laughs> <at> the <time. laughs> and the story is set in Tacoma, Washington, mm -hmm. and it's a story about a about a guy of upper middle class guy who's yeah. got a fancy car and wife and kids yeah, and two kids two boys and, and a wife yeah that's the one that I illustrated and it's it's it is it is a uh, I mean it is one of the two pauses in the, in the story and it's it's interesting in that even though it, even though it uh, in addition to it being different you know a pause in the story it's also a break in how Spade talks because Hammett says that that um, Spade started, he just starts into the story. It's like the, the, the chapter starts and then Spade sits her down, sits Bridget down, and begins to tell the story in a way that he's never told the story before. The Flitcraft Parable, which is about this guy standing on a street corner in front of a building that's incomplete and having a beam fall from 15 stories up, come right down and narrowly miss him. Yeah and chip off a piece of the sidewalk that mm -hmm. fires up and flits, you know, cuts his face. Yeah, Flitcraft yeah. just leaves. He, well, he, yeah. the, he has this moment where he could have died and he didn't, and so he figures everything else around him, he, it, it, it isn't relevant anymore. His world has just changed, and he walks down to the train station, the Union Station, gets on a train and he doesn't don't. call his wife, doesn't yeah. check in, leaves behind his golf, appointment that afternoon, <laughs> leaves his car behind yep, and jumps day. on and disappears. Yeah. Hammett was born in Baltimore and um, sort of as a young um, young man got dropped out of school and ended up kind of working through a bunch of different jobs eventually working for the Pinkerton detectives which was in those days in the early part of the 20th century was mainly sort of private police and a little bit of thuggery you know for for fee not only was he in the First World War, but he got flu during the influenza epidemic of 1918, which um, aggravated into tuberculosis. Um, and as a young veteran after the war, when the Pickerton job after the war took him out to Spokane and then into the into the kind of struggle in the minefields of Montana. Uh, by 1920, he is um, really um, taken down by by the uh, by tuberculosis. He's you know at 26 years old, he uh, is uh, referred to the medical hospital, the newly built um, public health hospital in Tacoma, in early November, early uh, winter of 1920. Um, got off the night train from Spokane and arrived, uh, you know, probably a rain, rainy night and walked off the train and stood there in front of Union Station and took the streetcar up to the hospital, uh, checked in, and then that winter of 1920-1921, young Samuel Hammett spent uh, in Tacoma. He landed in Tacoma at a time in 1920 where he just happened to drop into a city for in a dark, wet winter where um, Tacoma was descending into a period in its own history that was just unlike any time before since, um, 
uh, Prohibition had started in 1916. Tacoma was a huge town for breweries, so that industry was in collapse. Um, organized crime and corruption within the city had really taken over the elected officials and uh, the upstanding organizations in the city in many ways were just as broken and corrupt as the um, gangsters and the organized crime that was starting to really get get in get fully blown around prohibition and Tacoma was a city that prospered on adult entertainment and just the kind of dark side of human behavior and um, and for a young 26 year old artist to step into that and be inspired by that is just you know it must have been overwhelming for him And looking back, I mean, you can kind of imagine him following the days. A couple of big events occur during that winter. Um, a 49-year-old mill worker, a carpenter who worked out in the mill on the on the port, um, lived up on the hilltop, um, which was kind of working class in those days. He decided to walk down to a newsstand that his two older sons kept down at 19th and Jefferson in the, what would today be the middle of the University of Washington, Tacoma. And um, he decided to go out, a little bit unusual. His wife cautioned him, you know, be careful out there. There's, you know, there's robbers on the street. But he walked down the hill going to meet the boys down there and he got down to near 19th and Jefferson and a young police officer named Kraft, Officer Kraft, had just picked up a report of, a, of an armed robbery. He was uh, coming from the call box and he saw the, the mill worker, was a perfectly innocent guy, but who at the time must have just had in the back of his mind that there, his, the caution of his wife. And so uh, he heard the voice of the police officer yelling at him and the police officer was in a dark tunic and just kind of um, yelled at him to stop and instead of stopping he started to run and uh, ran down behind where, uh, got down to about where the Harmon build, the back side of the Harmon building today in the heart of the campus and uh, Officer Kraft pulled out his um, service revolver and fired in the air a couple shots, didn't stop um, so he, um, the next purely cautionary shot he fired into the sidewalk, uh, into the street and just on a complete random fluke, the, uh, the, the bullet hit the granite curbstone and ricocheted up. It was over a hundred yard shot, so a long, totally unintentional shot. The bullet came up, went into the ribs of the, of the uh, 49 year old mill worker and um, 20 minutes later he was dead. The mill worker's name was Samuel Hamblett. So with the exception of one letter being different, um, it was the same name as, because Dashiell Hammett would only use Dashiell as his name, as a pen name. His name at the time, everybody called him Sam, and he was Samuel Hammett. So you can imagine on the morning of the 15th, picking up the newspaper and reading this story about, first of all, seeing your name, that you're dead, <laughs> on the front page of the paper, and then, and then reading the details of how it was a random, totally, um, by chance kind of shooting. On the corner of 11th and Pacific downtown, the, the sort of A corner, the busiest, most important corner in the city on Pacific Avenue, a, um, the tallest building ever built in Tacoma was under construction. It was the Scandinavian American Bank building. And uh, Scandinavian American Bank in those days um, was the biggest bank in town. One in every eight people in Tacoma kept their money in the Scandinavian American Bank. They were the bankers for the city of Tacoma. The governor kept his money there. I mean, it was 
It was the prestigious bank in town, and they were building the biggest skyscraper ever built in the city in 1920. The steel frame of the building was all pretty much in place, and then in January of 1920, um, all of a sudden one day, nobody showed up for work. Um, everybody thought it was strange. I mean, it had work stopped so abruptly that the steel girders, 20 stories up in the air, 18 stories up in the air, um, they didn't even hammer over the rivets holding the girders in place. Work stopped so quickly. And it turned out um, that uh, Ole Hansen, the president of the bank, had been using depositors' money to build the building and the money had run out. Huge scandal. Most of the 1920s, the busiest intersection in Tacoma was loomed over by the skeleton of an incomplete fiasco of a project. And, um, and Hammett would no doubt have noted that, that amid the times when it seemed like all of the, of the dastardly bootleggers and gangsters that were running the, the speakeasies and stuff, were pulling off crimes. They were petty compared to what was going on with the most prestigious, highest ranking people in the whole, you know, in the whole cities. He stood there at 20, at 11th and Pacific at that yeah. uncompleted building that was, you know, it was um, corrupt in a, in a, in a uh, political and in a social way Whereas in the Flitcraft parable, it's a physical way where the beam falls because the building doesn't have integrity, doesn't yeah. have structural integrity. And it doesn't care. In, in real life, it doesn't yeah. have integrity of, of the people, <laughs> of the leadership of the city that owned it. And then the whole, the whole fact about, about that, that mill worker with his name yeah. getting killed by a random bullet that just bounces up off the street and you yeah. wonder, and that's that's the moment in Flitcraft Parable where yeah. where he's just kissed by fate, you know that way. Yeah, I think so. It's just a big, you know, it could be seen as like it's a big corrupt, uncaring world. Not necessarily that's out to get you, but you know, it's uh, definitely not out to save you. I like the way Hammett went about describing the character. He was both very clear about some of the features, but then he would also throw in uh, some wording that described the character in a way that, that wasn't visual. So he described Spade as being, um, you know, all of his features coming to a V, like his hairline, um, his ears were somewhat pointed. He, he said he looked someone like, somewhat like a, a blonde Satan. So when I was drawing Spade, I tried to give him that sort of um, blonde, devilish look. It's not a long form thing. I mean, it, it was, originally it was just done to um, accompany the editorial. It was part of the overall editorial piece on Hammett. And so it was just to show you, you know, uh, Hammett's sort of take on on Tacoma and you know give you a sort of a sampling of how he how he wrote and what it was like and you know and of the parable. I did some experiments and I, I found that I didn't want the colors to be very bright or very um, well done. Again it's like I wanted to keep it cheap and sort of pulpy and then the way that the colors were applied um, also made it look really kind of rushed and um, Again, cheap because they were they were instead of following the edges nicely, all the, the color shapes were cut out and applied very very quickly and very fast. So it was all you know it was all um, done to sort of replicate what was um, available or possible at the time, and all done in the service of telling the story because a big part of making all of those decisions as far as 
uh, the type of line work, the way the characters are drawn, uh, the color, uh, the lettering, the balloons, everything like that, all goes into um, visually creating a piece that when you look at it, it suggests a certain feeling, a certain atmosphere, so that you don't almost have to read the story to find out what kind of story it is. You can actually just sort of look at it and get a feel for, okay, yeah, this is a, you know, this is a, a gritty, there's a grittiness to the story and it's not overproduced and it's not overdone and, it, you know, it's a very sort of morphing. The parable, my ad ad adaptation of it, is fairly colorful as far as um, noir comics go, but I think it's the, it's the texture and the characterization that sort of pulls off that noir psychology. So that's, that's what I was going for when I did that. The, today now, people that are trying to look at Dashiell Hammett as an important literary figure and just the advances he made in literature and, and popular culture in America, really, or in the world for that matter, they, they, everybody wants to kind of find, what's this guy about? Where's he coming from? What's it all about? And now, Historians and um, literary critics, in fact, one of the best biographies of Dashiell Hammett uh, is called Falling Beans, and it basically takes the Flitcraft parable and it says, look, you know, if you want to understand this writer, understand the, the core um, uh, ethic, the core values of of Dashiell Hammett and really projected large of, of noir fiction in general. Look at the at the at the Flitcraft parable, read the Flitcraft parable.